Good morning. If y'all would like to go ahead and stand with us, we're going to start you off with a more of a classic than what we usually play is Victory in Jesus.
It's your faithfulness, oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart.
For our mission moment this morning, we're going to be talking about what John Wyatt's been doing. For those of you that may not know John, he is a minister of the gospel in Raynell, West Virginia, and the surrounding area. So he's not that far from us, about a 45-minute drive from here. John pastors two small mission churches in Bellwood and Duo. His ministries include nursing homes, a food pantry, Prisoners for Christ Jail Ministry, Philemon House Ministry to young men coming out of incarceration, working with ex-offenders and recovering addicts, outreaches through music and Appalachian culture talks, and videos on his Facebook page, John Wyatt, the Appalachian. He is also a chaplain for the Greenbrier County Sheriff's Department. Due to the ongoing pandemic, the Prisoners in Christ Jail Ministry is still on hold. John keeps checking to see when this ministry may open back up. The homeless population in his area is growing, and John will be spending time in the next few weeks to try to find someone to sponsor a homeless shelter in the area. The drug problem in Western Greenbrier County has increased significantly, and John has organized multiple congregations and government organizations in a movement called Heal Our Land. This photo is from a meeting this past February where many churches got together to pray and to discuss the issues at hand. John works also with an organization called Appalachia Service Project out of Johnson City, Tennessee, 
that sponsors mission trips in central Appalachia. Groups of 40 to 70 teens take on high impact home repairs in many needy locations. John holds Appalachian culture nights with the teens that come from such places as Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and others. In the last couple of months, John has spoken to about 1,500 teens. He's done this for many years, typically seeing 2,000 to 2,500 teens each summer. The Appalachian Service Project was founded by Methodist Minister Reverend Glenn Tex Evans since 1969. More than 440,000 volunteers from across the nation have repaired more than 19,000 homes. And in the process, Appalachian families, volunteers, and staff have been immensely blessed. Today, with the help of more than 15,000 volunteers each year, their goal remains to make homes warmer, safer, and drier for families in need. Here's some of the prayer requests that John shared with me. Uh, pray about John's ministry to people in need. Um, we're going to do another food drive. There's a box out in the lobby for collecting food for John's food pantry, and we'll be collecting that food till Wednesday, August 17th, and then I'll be taking it over there to him. Um, pray for a sponsor for a halfway house that John is trying to set up. Um, pray for the Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholic Anonymous meetings that John is involved with with his staff. Uh, John has an assistant, a 42-year-old man named Donnie, and his daughter-in-law uh, is in premature labor right now. So she's in Charlotte or in Charleston, West Virginia right now at the hospital. And John is 74 years old, and he suffers from severe back pain, but that does not stop him from ministering to the Lord. So be in prayer for John. All right, thanks for that update, Steve. I have several announcements, as you can see, from all the paperwork here. I'll try to juggle it uh, this morning, and it's good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, on uh, August the 1st, which is tomorrow, that's when our Piecing Life quilting will meet uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, August the 3rd, Harry Newman is going to be giving his testimony during the uh, prayer room. That starts at 6.30 on Wednesday night. And uh, he's been in area churches already giving his testimony, just a, an amazing testimony, just everything that uh, he has been through and he's learned, and uh, you'll, you'll really be blessed by hearing his testimony. Uh, August the 6th is a slopstacle. That's next Saturday. I have a note to read for that. Uh, Slopstacle is coming up Saturday from 11 to 2 p.m. Registration begins at 10.30 a.m. This will be held at Covington Bible Church, and it's for kindergarten through the sixth grade. Bring a change of clothes. It will be a lot of messy fun. And uh, they also said we need cookies for Slopstacle. Anyone willing to donate store-bought or homemade cookies Please have them at the church by 1 p.m. on Friday, August the 5th. So that'll be a, a fun time for our elementary uh, school children. Uh, also, uh, next Sunday, we'll be celebrating communion. And uh, on August the 14th is our worship in the park. We won't meet here. We'll meet over to Jackson River Sports Complex. Uh, the service will start at 1030. There will be no Sunday school that morning, uh, so everything will take place in the park, and, and we'll have hot dogs and things like that after the service. August the 21st is when Impact Teen starts meeting again on Sunday night from 6 to 8. That particular night, it's from 6 to 8. Uh, we'll have the end of summer bonfire and worship. And uh, it's been quite a while since our youth have met on Sunday night, so this is an answer to our prayers. And another answer to our prayer that... 
uh, many of you uh, have prayed for is uh, Blake Allen. Blake, stand up. I don't know if everybody knows you or not. <laughs> this is our youth pastor. He's been, uh, he's been working with us since uh, the middle of June, right? And so uh, he's been a blessing and uh, been sitting in on his Sunday school classes. And we're and, uh, just uh, glad he's here and he's starting our youth group back up. That'll be August 21st. Uh, also, uh, we have a note here. Uh, it says, Brother Billy, Andy, and Luke, thank you so much for the wonderful service uh, for Rich, our family, and friends. Thank you all for the food and especially your prayers that helped bring us through. Special thanks to all the deacons for being Rich's pallbearers, Steve All, Tim Bradley, Daniel C., and Dan Fay. He would be very pleased. God bless you all. And that was a thank you note from Corley Hastings and family. Thank you, Corley. And uh, also this past week, uh, uh, Corky Downer went to be with the Lord, and we had a really uh, a nice service yesterday to honor his life and just the, the impact he had on so many people. And uh, let's remember to keep uh, Janice and, and uh, her family in our prayers as they uh, uh, go through this grieving time. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for loving us, and we thank you for uh, this church where we can come and worship you. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for our missionaries around the world and even right here locally as we uh, honor John Wyatt and pray for him this week and the ministry that he has with uh, the people there in West Virginia and just the, the impact that he has and the outreach that he has. We just thank you that we can be a, a small part of that. Uh, dear Lord, we just pray this morning that uh, our hearts will be open and ready to receive your word, dear Lord, that we won't take your word lightly, dear Lord, but we will uh, be direct in, in, in responding to your word and also into living our lives around other people that we will show our love uh, of, that we have for you uh, to others. And we just uh, thank you for the, all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. You know, all throughout Scripture, uh, God tells us in several different places, obey my commands, obey my commands, obey my commands. Matter of fact, in 1 John, he even goes a bit further and expands on that and says, my commands are not burdensome. And he's right, they're not. So, um, you know, God always knows what's best for us. He knows what's good. He knows what's not so good for us. And he's always faithful, right? So that's why it's so important for us to put our faith and our hope and our trust in God and obey what he tells us. So let's all stand and sing, trust and obey.
singing, guys. Thank you. As uh, good to see you back, Steve. Feeling better? Where'd you go? How many times do you have to practice how to say Appalachian? Never get it right. Yeah, I, I, I don't either. Actually, today, uh, the passage we're going to be looking at, John, 1 John chapter 3, verses 19 through 24, uh, is actually one of the most difficult passages in Scripture to translate uh, because of the way that the, the Greek grammar is written and because of uh, the context that that passage is in. So I want to share with you a couple of uh, stories that try to illustrate uh, how communication is so important. In 2011, I was on deployment, uh, which on the USS Enterprise, it's a, a, an aircraft carrier. And we went to this island called Mallorca in the Mediterranean. It's a Spanish island. It's south of Spain. And the city we pulled into was the Palma de Mallorca. And one of the great joys of any sailor's heart is to get off the ship in a foreign port of call and to go explore the local culture. And I was especially excited because I speak Spanish and we were going to a Spanish island. Does anybody care to hazard a guess what language they speak on Palma de May uh, in Mallorca? German. <laughs> and on top of that, I had visions in my head of like empanadas and tapas and paella and all this Spanish food, but the guys I went out with wanted to go to this Italian restaurant. Like we're in Spain, man. So we go to this Italian restaurant on the German-speaking Spanish island of Mallorca. And the menu is in Spanish, or Italian. But the waiters all speak German. And they don't even put like, you know, when you go to some of the, 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 the Asian food places, sometimes they, they put the English uh, letters for what you're, you know, I'm going to have the kumgaza uh, zao, you know, it's like fried cat with lemongrass or something. Right? Well, they didn't even do that. There weren't even pictures on the menu to look at to see what you were trying to get. But Italian is similar to Spanish, and so I'm like doing my best to help the guys out. And, you know, the, the first guy orders, and, and what we think he's getting is like a spicy red sauce noodle with seafood on it. And then the, the next guy, what we think he's getting is like seared scallops and calamari in an Alfredo sauce. And what I think I'm getting is like a uh, carpaccio. You guys know what carpaccio is? It's a, uh, um, uh, almost a raw seafood, but instead of cooking it, they soak it in acid of like lemon or lime and add other, you know, vegetable. It's delicious. So this is what we think we're getting. Did I get carpaccio wrong? Okay. What actually came, though, for the first guy was like a crusty rice with just the heads of prawns. The next guy, who, who we thought was getting seared scallops in an Alfredo sauce, what he actually got was chicken fried fish with like unsauced noodle swirl on the side. We're like, hmm. So now I'm like, wonder what fresh seafood is going to mean. They come out with an electric kettle and put it on the table and they turn it on and it starts to boil. And then they come out with like a clay uh, vessel. Now, before I go and explain this, I have to, to share, I have a superpower. I can order off the menu the most dramatic thing that you can imagine that's on the menu. I mean, if they've got a, a three foot long crab leg dish Somehow, that's what I'm going to order. And it, you know, everybody in the restaurant is going to be looking like, where is that going to? I went on another Navy trip to Oslo, Norway, and they had a dish that was something Viking. I'm like, well, that's what I got to get. It was literally a foot and a half, well, their metric, 40 centimeter long 
sword with like seal and reindeer and whale over a chalice of like uh, lingonberry, like I guess the blood of your enemies or something. Like this was, uh, so here we are in this Italian restaurant on the Spanish island which speaks German that we don't know what they're ordering and I'm getting something fresh. There were live shrimps in this clay pot that they brought out that they poured the boiling water over and then stuck a little lid on it and their little antennas are like, I'm like, I can't do this. This is, this is way over. And all of this was because I didn't understand the Mediterranean culture. Like, you wouldn't do this in an American restaurant. They would, PETA would come down and chain themselves to your front door for torturing shrimps. Like, it, I mean, nor did I speak the language. There was a barrier here. There was a problem. And it's not just when we have cross-culture. There's a friend of mine from high school. We used to, you know, what do they call it? Dating, going steady. What's the word today? Anyhow, we, you know, we, we spoke the same language. We grew up in the same hick town. Was, after like 30 years, she calls me up. You know, her life is terrible, all these things going on. And, you know, she's like, you, you are a Baptist pastor. You wouldn't say that Jesus is the only way to God, would you? I said, of course not. I wouldn't say that. Meaning, how ridiculous and absurd would it be if by the authority of Andy Bellinger, I said that Jesus were the only way to God? What she heard was what she wanted to hear. Andy's a good guy. What Andy means is the Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, sent his son to this earth who said, I am the only way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to God but through me. That's the authority that says it. The scripture says it. Not, I wouldn't say that, meaning, of course not. That's absurd. Who would I be to say that? But you see, she heard one thing because she, she wanted to hear. There was a, a presupposition inside of her mind when she asked that question and an expectation of what she wanted to hear. So today's passage, what we're going to look at is, is often misunderstood or, or even um, mistranslated sometimes because of this very thing. So would you join me in prayer uh, as we get to the Word of God? Father, I, I thank you for the lives, the love, the, the sharing that has happened over this uh, past few days with the, the passing of Corky, and before that through, through Richard, and just the love that has been shown, the care in deed and in truth that has reached out into these people's lives. Lord, I ask today that whatever... Um, issue is, is occupying our mind, whatever uh, problem may, may be pushing the impact of your word from reaching our heart, that your Holy Spirit would pierce through that, that you would give us the space intellectually and emotionally to, to understand and feel the power of your word. Lord, I ask for myself that you would keep my uh, mind on track, that you would keep my my words true to the meaning that John intended to his audience. And Lord, I pray this uh, by the power of your spirit that, is, that has been given to us because of the sacrifice of your son. Amen. Well, as you remember last week, I uh, made the point that you have to, when you approach these letters, uh, remember where you are. Context is king. We spoke about that even a little bit this morning in the adult Bible class. And I gave the illustration that I'm going to repeat because it's almost lunchtime and this is a helpful illustration to get you engaged. The book of 1 John is like Neapolitan ice cream. There's a vanilla, a chocolate, and a strawberry. Chocolate. Yeah, I remember when they invented chocolate. So the vanilla is this doctrinal truth. Who is the person of Jesus? What did he do? And John gets into that in the first four verses. And then he goes into the, if you really believe in this person, your life will personally change. This moral issue. And he takes a scoop out of the chocolate. 
the moral side. And then he moves into the strawberry and he says, and that way that you act toward God will also be true of the way you act toward people around you. And in chapter two, verses three through 11, he he addresses this social issue. And then he returns and he digs a little deeper into the vanilla, the the doctrinal issue about who Jesus was in chapter 12 through 27. And then he goes back to the chocolate and digs. And, And today we're still continuing with that social aspect. Now we're going to get into the actual application part of the truth that he explained last week. What are the implications of knowing that we need to love one another, not just in word, but in deed and in truth? And so we continue in chapter 3, beginning in verse 19. By this, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. And we're going to stop right there for now. And and again, these are the practical results that come about by obeying God's command to love one another in tangible ways. And the first question we get is in verse 19, it says, by this. And the question we ask ourselves, is John then going to say the thing that's by this? Or are we supposed to look backwards to what he just said? Is it by loving in deed and truth and not in word only that we're supposed to then do these things? Or is it these things that are supposed to explain it? Well, uh, in this situation, the by this is referring to what he has just explained, the loving in deed and in truth. And that was in verse 18, little children. This is a term of endearment of identification with God the Father. You are born again of him. You belong to him. The world looks at you as a Christian. Other Christians look at you as a Christian. God looks at you through the blood of Jesus Christ. You are belonging. You are a child of God. Because of that, let us not love in word or talk or literally tongue, but in deed and in truth. And when we do that, we shall know that we are of the truth. Now, when you see the truth or the light in, in, in 1 John, it's referring to Jesus Christ. This is, a, is, is another way of saying his name, okay? And then there's two future truths he's going to share. One is that we are of the truth, but they're conditional the, the truth of it, the knowing it, the by this is conditioned on whether you are walking in deed and truth or if you are just loving in talk and word. So the first one is loving in deed and truth shows by experience. By the way, we, we mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago that the, the, the English word know is actually representing two different aspects of knowing something. You can know something because you've been taught that thing. You can also know something because you've experienced that thing to be true. And, and sometimes you have to take what you know and you have to convince yourself that that's really true and act according to it and then you get to experience the truth of it. Any of y'all uh, been married for any period of time, I know, or I'm just the weird one, but you have to tell yourself, I love this woman And I'm going to do this thing for her, even though at the moment, you might not feel quite like it. But see, when you act in love, when you do get up and turn the light off, even though, or go to Lowe's and buy the new ceiling fan that's got the remote control like I did, right? You you then have that emotional, that experiential response. Well, here, John is using that word for that experience When you look at somebody who has a need and God has given you the means to meet that need and you actually do meet that need, even if they might misuse your gift, you're going to experience the knowledge that I did this because I know God loved me first. He loved me when I was a sinner. He went to the cross knowing people would not accept that gift. But he went to the cross anyhow. And we can express that godly love toward others because it came from God, not from us. 
And then the next thing that we get to, to know, that we get to experience that is true, it's all right to wake him up. I mean, I've had days like that. I've felt like that preaching before. <laughs> Especially if my notes don't work. Then I just want to be like, forget about it. I'm going to bed. I'll figure it out. They're working today. Loving in deed and truth is persuasive to our heart if we are condemned by it during time of prayer. So I, I am interpreting a lot of words right here and giving the, the, the meaning to them as I understand them. But I want to explain to you why people have come to this conclusion. Because if you look in your notes, you will see that those first two words in verse 20 are translated three different ways in three different translations. In the English Standard Version, it says, for whenever. In the New American Standard, it says, in whatever, the 1995. In the 2020 version, they realized the English Standard Version guys were right and changed it to the ESV. And in the King James, it says, for if. Now, I didn't put enough of the King James in there because it's actually for if our heart condemn us. And, and those of you who speak English natively just heard me say something that didn't sound quite right. For if our heart condemn us, what should it be? Condemns us. In fact, they, they changed that to that in the new King James and actually made it worse. See, because in the King James, they use what's called the bare verb. They did not give you the S at the end so that it fit the sentence correctly because you're supposed to know in 17th century English that a conditional clause that has a subjunctive in the protasis is a third-class conditional statement where the author understands that the condition being presented may not be true. And that's a lot to take in because we don't talk like that today. We don't write like that today. What we do is we say, if your heart should condemn you, or if ever your heart should condemn you, that gives the, the sense of that. It's possible your heart is not condemning you. So why, why all these translations? Why is it so different? Is it, is, you know, there's, there's prejudice about this. There's deep set training that's happened in people's lives and they don't know what's happened in the background. This is why slavery lasted so long in the United States and people literally misused the word of God to promote something like slavery or to prevent women from being able to vote or be able to have jobs because people didn't understand. And one of the best things you can do when you face that kind of prejudice is to overcome it by educating and revealing the truth. What happened? Why is there a difference? I want to show you a picture right here. How old do you think the document that this picture is of? Of, is, is, of, is. How old do you think that thing is? What's, what's old? Give me, a, give me a number that's old. Go ahead. Shout it out. 500? 900. Is 900 old? That's not even half as old as this document is. This document came from about 350 A.D. It's still around today. It was found at St. Catherine's Monastery. This is 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. There's the start of it right there. You see that little letter O? Now, if you spoke Greek, what name would you give to a little letter O? O micron. That's literally micro. What about a big letter O? I am the alpha and the O mega. I mean, that literally is the difference. Big O, little O. Well, it turns out in Greek, that by itself is a word. And the next two letters by themselves are a word. And the next three letters by themselves are a word. But when they wrote it in Greek, they didn't put periods or spaces or capital letters. They just wrote, or lowercase letters, they just wrote in all caps all together. And it didn't matter to them if they carried a word over from one line to the next. This K-A 
what looks like a P, and then a, that is cardia. That's the word for heart. They just kept on trucking, like don't waste the space. So when you're translating and you're looking at this manuscript, you have to make a decision. Is that three words, ha, ti, aeon? It could be. In fact, grammatically, that's the best explanation. That's what the New American Standard Bible of 1995 did, is they looked at the grammar. All right. Y'all remember Schoolhouse Rocks, conjunction, junction, what's your function? A lot of you like, I flunked Schoolhouse Rocks, I went right to after school specials, right? <laughs> well, let me get a little Schoolhouse Rocks for you without singing. Why without singing? Because the other day I was folding my clothes and I was singing and Dawn came running in here. She's like, what's wrong? I said, nothing. I was singing. She's like, oh, I thought you stubbed your toe. That's not a story. That really happened. <laughs> Grammar is where you look at the individual word and you say, what kind of word is this? Is it a noun? Is it a verb? Is it a conjunction? Is it a, a preposition? Let me give you a sentence. I threw Daniel's ball at Steve and Kathleen. In that sentence... I, Daniel, Ball, Steve, and Kathleen are all what? At is a preposition. Through is a... You guys are killing it. Now, in that sentence, how is the word Daniel's functioning? What's the effect of that noun? It's a possessive noun. Is it a, what about ball? What is that function? It's the direct object, right? At, that's the indirect object, Steve and Kathleen. When you figure out what those words are doing in a sentence, what do you think that's called? Syntax. Now, if I use that sentence just by itself, everybody has kind of a different vision in mind of what's going on. But if I put it in a, in a paragraph, like the other day, we had uh, dinner and a movie with games instead of a movie. We had dinner and games. And Daniel had bought a pickleball set, and he brought it out. And Steve and Kathleen were playing with Dan and Susan. And the ball got out of hand, and so I threw the ball I threw Daniel's ball at Steve and Kathleen. What, now, the picture in your mind is I'm being helpful, right? Daniel was being helpful by providing the pickleball set. But let's say what I'm doing is we're holding the uh, uh, polar plunge. And we've got couples dunk tanks this time. Icy water and Steve and Kathleen are sitting there at one and Daniel has purchased a ticket, and I'm the guy who has to throw the ball at the thing. So I threw Daniel's ball at Steve and Kathleen. Daniel's goodwill is all of a sudden changed to Stephanie getting back at her sister. <laughs> you see that? That's context. It's the exact same sentence, but the meaning of that sentence changes based on how it's being used in the, in, the, in the whole paragraph. Do you guys see that? Schoolhouse rocks, man. It really does. And in the Greek, the best grammar is with three words. And the best syntax is what the, the uh, uh, King James tries to do and the NIV tries to do. But in context, it's like pineapple on pizza. It's not good. <laughs> Why? Because the word hati can be translated as either because or if. See, in the, the, the local sentence, it makes the most sense to say if my heart or if our heart condemns us. But in the, in the whole flow, in the, in, the, in the context of what John is trying to say, it makes the most sense in context to translate that as because whenever your heart condemns you. 
And that's why the translators, and and you need to understand that when when they're translating English translations, they're not looking at these original manuscripts. They're looking at typed up printed copies where somebody made that decision from the hand copies about how to divide that. They provide the spacing and the punctuation. I, I, I want you to understand there's no conspiracy to change God's word. What there is is a desire by scholars who deeply love the Lord to best express the meaning of God's word in a language that was foreign to how God's word was written. Why would your heart condemn you? Why would you go before the Lord in prayer and your heart condemn you? Aren't you forgiven by the blood of Jesus? Why would your heart condemn you? Well, this word is actually used elsewhere in Scripture. It's used of the Apostle Peter. If you remember in in Galatians, this is a book Paul wrote. And Paul is recounting an event that happened when he interacted with the Apostle Peter. Peter was at Antioch when Cephas, that, that is the, also Peter, it's just in a different language. I opposed him to his face, Paul said, because he stood condemned. Now, is Paul saying that Peter has lost his salvation? Absolutely not. What he's saying is Peter did something wrong and he knew he did something wrong. And when Paul approached him about it, Peter recognized he was doing something wrong too. You know what? We do that too. We know the right thing to do and sometimes don't do it. We know the wrong thing to do and sometimes we do it. And so when we go to the Lord and we're in this time of prayer and we want him to hear us and we realized failed you again, Lord. Our heart stands condemned. And what John is trying to write right here is about what happens when your heart stands condemned before the Lord. Why would our heart condemn us? Because we are actually guilty of the sin that we know we did. And what John is trying to say, but we know that our confidence for our salvation, our confidence of approaching the Lord is not in our works. It's not in how good of a boy or how good of a girl we've been. It's how good of a man Jesus was and how great of a sacrifice he made on that cross. That's where our confidence is. And that's what John is saying when he says that God is greater than than our heart. The way that you feel about yourself approaching God is not decisive about whether God is going to, even whether you're guilty of that sin or not. What changes is whether you repent of that sin and you admit that you have that sin and you confess that sin to God and you genuinely sorrow that you have offended the creator God of the universe by letting him down, that you're committed to not doing it again. That's, that's what establishes it. We know that he is greater. And the second argument that John makes is, you know, it's not like you're hiding the thing anyhow from God. It's not like, like God doesn't already know. It's not like God didn't already know when he went to the cross in the first place. It's not like Jesus didn't know before the creation of all earth, before God even spoke and said, let there be light, knowing the beings he was going to make to represent him in the universe before the angels and everything were going to fail him tremendously. And the only way to restore that was to send his son. And John has already said that. And he says, when you go to the Lord in prayer and your heart is condemning you, that's what you need to understand. God is greater than your heart. And he already knows everything. He says, beloved, Now, this is the opposite side. This is the the other response you can have. If your heart does not condemn you, 
then you have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. So the question is, is it possible for you or I to go before God in prayer without feeling condemned? Can you go to the Lord in prayer, let's say in thanksgiving, and, and not feel condemnation because of something that you've not done? Some people have a hard time with this because they think that they should never go before the Lord without feeling condemned. But God wants you to not feel condemned when you are not sinning. In fact, John says that. We have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. I'm going to talk about that because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him in just a second. But I want to share with you this quote from, um, what's Bonhoeffer's first name again, Brother Billy? Dietrich. Dietrich would feel right at home on Mallorca because they speak German too. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of the most incredibly difficult authors to read. It's like open heart surgery every time. And he has a, has a book out there called Life Together. He died in, in a prison camp in Germany during World War II. And he wrote this. He knows, this is his summary of these two verses, by the way, chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, talking about the difference between when your heart does and when your heart does not condemn you before the Lord. He says, we know that God's word in Jesus Christ pronounces him guilty. We know that. Even when he does not feel his guilt and God's word in Jesus Christ pronounces him not guilty and righteous. Even when he does not feel that he is righteous at all. So we, we need to know and reassure, we need to persuade our heart of the truth that God has said. If you confess your sin, he is faithful to forgive you, right? And not only forgive you, but to restore you from all your sin, to wash you clean. Our confidence that we are righteous must be in receiving the righteousness of Jesus, not the quality or the quantity of our works. If you are assessing any level of your life on earth based on how many good works or how good the works that you do are, you are not understanding the gospel of God. When John here writes, uh, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him, our intuition is to say that that's only true if we are keeping, like that's the conditional clause. But it's not a conditional clause, it's a statement of uh, explanation. The type of people God answers prayer for are his children. And what do his children do? They keep his commands. John has already said that. The difference between living in life and living in darkness is whether you keep the commands of God or don't. The difference between life and death is those two things. If you're a child of God, you will keep God's commands. You won't perfectly keep them. He's already said, if any man says he has no sin, that man is a liar. He makes God out to be a liar. But the characteristic of your life is to follow God, obey his commands. But you know, there are times when God does not hear your prayer, or at least will not answer your prayer. There's at least four times. There's many more, but I wanted to look at these because they're related to the, the conditional or the explanatory, the, the statement that John made here at the end of verse 22 because we keep his commands. And the first is if we're living in unrepentant sin. If one, Proverbs 28, 9, if one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. See, if you go before the Lord and you are living in perpetual sin and you know you are living in perpetual sin, God is also aware of that. You're not hiding that from him and he's not going to answer that prayer for you. God, I love my girlfriend so much and we're living together in the same home. Would you please bless our house? Uh, no, I won't because you shouldn't be living together unless you're actually married. Also, 
if you have the wrong motives in your prayer. James chapter 4, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. God, I so much want to retire and move on to that um, ex-Russian billionaire's yacht in the Mediterranean. Please let me win the mega bajillions with this, you know, $2 ticket. You are asking out of the wrong motive, and God is not going to answer that prayer. In fact, if that is your motive, he might answer that prayer just so that you can end up so bankrupt and destitute that you realize what an idiot you were for even asking that in the first place. At least that's what I would do, but I'm not God. Thank God. And then in, in this letter, we're going to see at least two more reasons that are related to this because the book of John is like Neapolitan ice cream and he keeps going back to the same topic and digging a little deeper and digging a little deeper. And in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 through 15, we're going to see that he's going to say, God won't answer your prayer if you're not asking according to his will or by faith. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will... He hears us, and we know that if he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Matthew's gospel phrases it this way, if you ask anything in my name, I will give it to you. And what that means is according to the purposes and according to the will that God has for you in your life. And if you aren't asking according to that, if you're not obeying his commands and doing what pleases him, He's not going to answer that prayer, and you shouldn't have confidence before him. But if you are asking according to his will, if you are asking according to his commands, then he will answer you, and you should have confidence. This is what John is saying. God is God. You're God's child. God's children obey his voice. Obey his voice. So what is this command that he has given us? What is this command that John keeps circling back on? Well, that's what we read in 1 John 3, 23. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Now, I've already said Matthew's gospel had said, if you pray in the name of Jesus, he will answer it. What does that mean to believe in the name? Well, let's just go ahead and ask John, since he wrote a whole gospel and used this term several times throughout it, maybe he can answer our question for us. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Chapter 20, verses 30 through 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So what does it mean to believe in the name? What does it mean to, to ask in the name? It means to understand, as John has already said in this letter, that Jesus was a historical person that he was prophesied as the Messiah, the anointed one, who is going to come and bring freedom from sin and freedom from bondage, that he was a, a sinless life, that he died for our sin and he resurrected bodily and he is going to return in the flesh. And second, that we love one another, but not love in the touchy-feely, I've got a boyfriend, girlfriend sort of way that isn't love at all, but satisfaction of yourself. But love in the way that God has commanded, sacrificially, looking to the needs of others, realizing the stuff you have, God has only loaned it to you while you're walking around with a heartbeat right now or until he should return. To evaluate the, the needs of others greater than you possessing these things God has given to you, right? To, to saying, hey, this, this person's life, I, I value that more than my stuff. And I'm actually going to, to let go of these things God has given me out of love for somebody else. And so he closes this section of this letter with this last uh, sentence, whoever keeps God's commandments abides in God. We've seen this word abide over and over. 
and God abides in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. What is John trying to say? John's trying to say, look, when you, child of God, do what children of God do, obey his commands to, you know, love him and love the people that God gave you in the world, not just in word and talk, but in deed and truth. When you do those things, you know and will then act according to the way that you know. I'm supposed to do this. God loved me first. I'm going to do these things God wants me to do because I love God and he loves me. Have you ever done something wrong in your house like, like, uh, Oh, I don't know, ran off in the middle of the night. And you get busted. The light's on when you go to come home. You're like, oh man, they're awake. And the window you went out is shut and locked. You can't get back in that way. And you don't want to go knock on that front door to get let back in because you know you're facing justice. Well, hopefully you had parents like that. Not everybody does. See, but if, if you aren't misbehaving, then when you get up in the morning and you go out to the, to the living room or whatever and breakfast is on and mom or dad wants to, you know, feed you, th there's this ex expectation that this is just you know, how families are supposed to be. That's exactly what John is saying right here. If you're acting the way God wants you to act, and when you go before him in prayer, you shouldn't have any condemnation, but you're not going to. So when you do feel that condemnation, you know that you can go to this God who's greater than your heart, who already knows these things, confess your sin, and then regain that confidence, and then start acting like you're supposed to act. And then when you pray to God, when you are before God and you are asking him, your presence is going to abide in God too. And he says, that's my child who wants this thing. I'm going to move the mountains because of their faith. That's John's message. This, this is what we're supposed to gain out of this, is that there is a blessing in the here and now when we obey God. And that blessing is, is more than just for us. It's actually for the glory of God. And when we do this, when we act like this, the world will know who Jesus is, and they too will want to come to know the Lord. As the praise team comes up and we close this today, the thing that's important about this, if you do not yet know God, is that God is not far from you no matter how many sins you have made. God is not far from you no matter how guilty you feel. God is not far from you no matter how guilty you are. He is only far from you when you reject God. He's not going to force himself on you. He's not going to demand and draw you kicking and screaming into heaven. He wants you to be his child And when you agree to be his child, you understand that he has purchased you out of sin because you are already a slave to the devil. You don't get that choice. You were born that way. And then you act out and you sin and you confirm your identity. But God wants to redeem you from that. He wants you to be able to go before him with confidence in your heart. Confidence that when you have failed him and sinned, he will forgive you. And confidence that when you have not been sinning, he hears your prayer and wants to answer your prayer. And the difference between those two states is whether you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ or whether you have not. And if you have not, again, God is not far from you. You must turn your heart toward God. And if you do, it's because God drew you to him in the first place. That can happen for you Right now, today, this very day, you go before the Lord and you say, God, I, I, I can tell you haven't been answering my prayer. I can tell you've been far from me. I can tell my heart is not engaged with your heart and I want that to be true of me. Lord, will you accept me 
as your child? Will, will, will you come and, and instill me with your spirit if I put my faith in you, if I'm willing to trust you with my eternal future? And if that's you today, if you've, if you've confessed that in your heart, if you've recognized that reality, that calling that God has on your heart, God is faithful to forgive you. God is faithful to redeem you. In a moment, in a split second, he takes away that dead heart of stone and replaces it with a soft, living heart. And he promises you that the work he has begun this day in you, he will be faithful to finish. Would you join me in prayer and you can get the lights, please. Father, I ask for the, the heart here today that has not submitted to your will, that has not confessed you as their Savior to be under a heavy burden, to be blocked from all other activity and all other thought and all other loves until they, they, they come to faith in you, Lord, that they'd be unwilling to, to even speak out of anguish in their heart that they have rejected you until they confess you. Father, I ask this because that soul has an eternity either in heaven or in hell, and we all want to glorify you by changing that eternity to one in heaven in your very presence. Father, would you bring your spirit into this place now and bring that conviction Bring that confession so that we may rejoice like that shepherd that's found the lost sheep and the woman who's found the lost coin and the father whose prodigal has returned. I ask this in the, in the power of your son, Jesus Christ, and in the sacrifice that he paid in his death and in the promise that he gave in his resurrection and the hope we have in his return. All right, I'll ask that you go ahead and stand with us. We're going to finish up with Draw Me Close.
Thank you all for coming this morning. Have a good rest of your Sunday.